closing half hour session of our circular construction event. I hope you found the breakout sessions interesting and informative and uh, got yourself ready for this final half hour. Unless, of course, you're doing the hackathon as well, in which case you've also got the afternoon to look forward to. Before we move on to our main event, our keynote, I just want to remind you that we've had three polls open since this morning, since around nine, um, and we've actually got the results now that we're just going to flash up and have a look. So we asked you, uh, the attendees, which part of the sector you're in, and uh, we've got almost half of architects, engineers, and contractors. Um, a few academics in there, uh, policy investor and developer at 14%, and uh, interestingly, over a quarter of you, um, almost a quarter, are not part of the built environment. But perhaps after today, you will be inspired to join us because there's certainly plenty to get done for all. Uh, the next poll there was how knowledgeable you are. Um, and interestingly, uh, no knowledge. So that's almost compares with those who aren't in the built environment. Um, some knowledge and 20% putting themselves in the top bracket of knowledgeable. Um, and we don't know how many are superstar knowledge experts, although we are about to hear from one, that's for sure. And the third one um, was, what do we need to reduce most in the built environment in London? I'm quite glad that it wasn't just all about cost, actually the lowest, almost a third in each of the other categories, waste, carbon emissions and material use. And I think um, it's, it's fair to say and true that the circular economy is certainly trying to deal with all of those. It should be reducing waste, carbon emissions and materials. So um, we actually have a final poll that we're running, which is going live now, um, again, on the Twitter feed. So at Circuit H2020. And we want to know if you're interested in getting more involved in the Circuit project, which of course has another three years to run. So this could be through further workshops, networking events, we put a project forward as a demonstrator, or indeed helping develop some of the digital outputs. Um, and there'll be uh, a way to um, sign up to that at the end of this. We'll put the link on Twitter. So are you interested in getting involved? Yes, not sure, don't think so. Hopefully it's a yes. So without further ado, I'm going to pass over to our keynote speaker, who I'm absolutely delighted to introduce, Sunan Prasad. Sunand is the co-founder of architectural practice Panoira and Prasad, which is a studio of Perkins and Will. He's also a London Mayor's design advocate, very importantly, a board member of UKGBC, where I work, chair of the advisory board of the Journal of Architecture and of Article 25, which is the humanitarian architecture charity. And recently, he's been appointed a specialist advisor to support specific aspects of the building better, building beautiful, Commission. And I'm delighted he's joined us today to give his latest thoughts on the circular economy in the built environment. So, Sanand, over to you. Thank you, Alistair. Really lovely to be in a tag team with you again. Um, so, I'm going to talk hopefully for around 12 minutes and then we'll have a chance to have a conversation, Alistair and I. And my talk is in um, two parts primarily. And I'm quite encouraged by those poll results because 67% of you have some knowledge, 20% have a lot of knowledge, and it's a relatively small number, uh, well under 20% that are complete newbies. But, um, but I'm gonna to try to address all of those constituencies. And I hope that the ones with a lot of knowledge will, will forgive me for trying to, to say what you already know so well. I want to talk firstly about how we're doing collectively in the circular economy, and then about what we as individuals and companies and organizations can do. The circular economy is a simple idea in many ways, and that simplicity comes from the idea of circularity. But of course, it is the economy. And what's great about the, this phrase is that it does involve the word economy. And the economy is extremely complex. So it's an idea that everyone can grasp, but the implications of it spin out very, very far and wide. And that makes it quite difficult to capture in terms of a simple linear program of what should we do now. 
but I hope to shed some light on it. Start by saying that, you know, extraordinary people are working on this uh, concept and the uh, Circle Economy Group has published this uh, recently about uh, late 2018. Uh, they've started a metric for measuring how circular we are. Only 9.1% circular on a world scale. Now, in all the things that I'm going to show, please do look it up uh, on, the, on the web. Nothing that I'm showing you is not available on the web. And if you can uh, look that up and train yourself uh, and become experts, it don't, won't take that long. Uh, the other parts of the uh, kind of data science sphere are equally busy in in trying to unearth what it is. How do we actually capture the economy of materials, of environmental damage, of uh, biomass, and, and so on around the world? And these kinds of graphs capture, on the, on the left hand, the extraordinary amount of extraction and the way that extraction of the Earth's resources is accelerating. And on the right hand, very fascinating, the, the stock that we are building up in our buildings and in our environment, and much of this is in the buildings, of that uh, extracted material. And both of these actually are, are, amount to a picture of, of addition and flow. 28% of all the outflows of waste and emissions since the turn of the century have happened in the last 13 years. Isn't that extraordinary? That's from of all you know, from 19, from the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, uh, or the middle of the Industrial Revolution. And a global convergence in material use patterns, if it goes on now, will be two and a half times more material demand than we have now. So as the polls show, materials are an incredibly important aspect of this. And again, another graphic that shows how it has accelerated since 2000. And um, the, the critical thing is that not only is it an issue of the environment, but actually the linear economy is literally running out of materials. And for the first time um, in, in all of the industrial age, resource prices have started shooting up. So it's actually becoming unaffordable. So that cost picture isn't necessarily as separate from the environment as some may think. As far as the building industry is concerned, I think many of you will know the headline figures. Use and construction of buildings produces 55% of total GHG emissions. You often hear the, uh, the number 40%, but actually if you look at the construction of buildings as well as uh, the, 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 the urban impacts, then those emissions are much higher than half of the total. And of course, it produces way over half the total of all UK waste to landfill. And I think numbers in other countries will be similar. I know we have a global audience, so uh, I hope that this is not UK centric. The circular economy, to my mind, is best captured in this diagram. And again, most of you will know about it, but, but it's actually very interesting to break down the natural and biological life cycle and the industrial product cycle and, and see that only renewable energy feeds it and there are no toxins coming out of it. And within uh, UK, I started with that number of 9% globally. That within the UK, there was actually a minor revolution uh, from about 2000 onwards. In 2000, RAP estimated that 8% of the total waste was recycled. In 2010, it had become 22%, and they were forecasting an ambition by 2020 to, to get to 27%. And I think those numbers are weighted. But as you can see, we tripled the amount of recycling between 2000 and 2010, which is, I think, not fully appreciated. It means that we can do it, but of course, those are some of the early wins. And what the circular economy now needs is a dramatic acceleration in all that. So that was about metrics and about trying to be clear about where we are. I think that's a very in important thing to get right, so track our progress. I want to just show you now very quickly a series of examples that have inspired me in the circular economy, starting with the, the great squares of London and the way Georgian builders put together buildings uh, and did so in a way that was incredibly adaptable. And actually, uh, I think many people don't realize now that you know, when, when there was quite a lot of demolition after the war in, in, in London, for example, and these buildings were demolished, many of those bricks were literally 
hand picked out because they were built in lime mortar and reused elsewhere, as was the timber and so on. So these are these are adaptable and recyclable buildings. So it's not something new. Although fast forward to 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 Netherlands today, the amazing uh, energy sprong program that retrofits whole houses in a single day, I think is a fabulous example of where we can go with this. With, with the circular and all the very much wider implications in terms of greenhouse gases uh, and uh, toxins, but also standardization uh, and uh, high quality and great design, all part of the same picture. In about in the 60s, Heineken actually started selling a bottle of beer, which was designed to be turned into bricks. And there was a kind of a extraordinary idea that this might solve the, the world's housing problem, some people suggested. Well, they didn't, I think, reckon on actually what the true numbers of beer drinkers are in the world. But actually, they didn't need to do that because in many parts of the world, uh, waste is seen as a resource and reused. Uh, and you know, here are any number of buildings built of bottles and even plastic bottles, and glass bottles around the world. We ourselves have, uh, not really realizing it was a circular economy, designed and built a building in London, in the east of London, in Dagenham, in about 1995, which was, in my, by my calculation, I must be about 80% circular. Uh, it had the slogan, touching the ground lightly and not circular economy. And the idea was that you could completely remove this building from its site because it was on screw anchors. And all the materials were either, you know, very simply produced timber, timber used as a crop, and where they weren't, uh, there was there were precast concrete. For example, the flags could be on the on the floor could be lifted and reused. There were a few non non recyclable items, uh, maybe like some of the ironmongery and so on, but even that could be, of course, smelted and reused, uh, and possibly the plasterboard. But um, we failed with the steel that was in the building, we specified recyclable steel, which uh, we could not then get because the contractor said it's cheaper for him to buy new. In the meantime, um, the Empire State Building has had all its windows dismantled and reassembled as double glazing and put back, which is an amazing feat. Um, and talking of windows, this illustrates one of the problems we have and one of the areas that we can tackle. Composite materials are very difficult to recycle. So on the left, we have the kind of windows we used to draw in timber when I was studying to be an architect. But now, of course, we buy them as products and they are very sophisticated composites. The bottom right one has glass, silicon, timber, ABS, and aluminium all together. Very difficult to disassemble and recycle and we need to find solutions to those. So these are all examples of either inspiring things uh, that we need to tackle or vexing problems that we actually collectively need to work on. Uh, Archetypes Enterprise Center, again, probably 80% recyclable uh, and more. A fantastic example of how, how to build a building. Uh, at this scale, it is possible to do it in timber with straw bales and so on. And probably one of our biggest challenges are the larger urban buildings of which this is one. This is our uh, project Oriel in St Pancras, and, and uh, we are aiming to see what we can do with the circular economy on this building uh, in line with section 17 of the Lon New London Plan requiring a circular economy statement. And uh, our core ideas so far are about the standardization of components, about the uh, shell and core concept, where the building is built from the beginning, conceived of as layers, where the site is the, the most long lasting layer, the shell uh, is the next uh, lasting layer, then there are the cores, the structure, and then of course the fit out and so on, all of which have to follow their own life cycles. And as long as we are aware of those, we might be able to very effectively um, practice circularity principles. So within those interiors, we hope to be using systems such as dirt, which is uh, pre made, recycled, and at the end of its life, it can be reconfigured, uh, working with dirt and uh, put up somewhere else.
Uh, the idea that you could actually simply take a manufactured material without cutting it, without waste, and use it directly in buildings was pioneered by Walter Siegel in the 60s. And he his approach was to use standard eight by four modules. The buildings were designed in, in modules. Uh, the timber sections were all not only pre-cut, but just delivered straight from the uh, from the mills to site and, and put up without the need for very much processing. So, you know, th these are inspiring thoughts that actually many of us can, can have ourselves and put in practice. Remanufactured paint, you know, that sort of says, says all that needs to be said. I think many of you will know about interface floor and its re use of uh, recycling carpet materials, but also the making of uh, carpets from discarded fishing nets. And not to forget that the idea of circularity means using redundant spaces, spaces that otherwise wouldn't be used. And then uh, finally, the uh, move to actually a fundamentally different economic paradigm about products, where products become services. So here in Shipol Airport, the light is what the client pays for, not the fittings, not the bulbs, just the lights indeed not the electricity either it gets paid for light and philips own the infrastructure they pay for the electricity they only charge per lux and that is a, a radical idea about how the economy might incentivize circularity now if you look at the websites of of great places like ellen macarthur foundation the case studies I'm very struck how there are relatively few concerned with the built environment, which in the end is responsible for so much of the waste and the energy. A lot of other sectors are, are, are very focused on this, and that is understandable because many other sectors uh, use actually products which are relatively uh, simple compared to buildings. Buildings are very complex products. I think we just must understand that and also see in that the opportunity for everyone to play a part. A huge volume of guidance exists now. I'm very encouraged by it. Uh, well, I was involved in, in a couple of these, including the design for the autonomy, the prime, uh, which supports the new London plan policies on the circular economy, which L. Warb and others have uh, played such a great part in, in, uh, in promoting and producing. Just behind that, health impacts. And then at bottom left is Google's own ideas about circularity. So this is an idea whose time has absolutely come. Um, and we all have a part to play in it, and we all can join into seeing how we're doing along it. I'll leave you with a slide, which is back to the idea of the creative use of waste. And, and again, very inspiring how children around the world are able to do that. Thank you very much. Alistair. Thank you, Sunand. Um, excellent uh, whiz through. Um, circularity and also some inspiring examples showing that it can be done. Uh, I, I'm myself a fan of the Walter Siegel houses. In fact, I live just one road away from Walter's Way uh, in Lewisham. Um, well worth an open house visit for those who live in London. And, and uh, if we're allowed to do open house visits again um, this year in COVID, fascinating. Um, again, you know, going back a couple of decades and then asking ourselves, how far have we really progressed on circularity? And I, I think that's a question I'd like to put to you, Sanan, which is, you know, you've got that stat about um, the world only being 9% circular. Um, and indeed, you reckon that you, you created a, a property in 1995, I think it was, which, you know, you think it was probably 80% circular. Yeah. But do you feel that the architectural and wider property industry really understands this term circular and when we're using it what is it that they should be aiming to achieve do, do you th do you think that's something in the in the thinking is that being taught well in in a way of course uh, a seminar like this is joined by people who are already uh, on the page as it were um, but had we had that poll two or three years ago you had very different numbers i think that the industry is beginning to grasp it. Um, and so it, it, for the first time, you know, since uh, my firm merged, we're now working very closely with 
with corporate interior designers. And there, uh, you know, given that corporate interiors are um, constructed and then pretty much scrapped every five to seven years, I think is the average life of, of a life of an interior. The realization is growing, not, not with the attitude of, oh my God, isn't it terrible what we're doing? But how amazing, we have an opportunity here to make a real contribution to making a more balanced, more sustainable world. So I think that that, that realization is growing. It's very far from settled. Uh, I, I think that the intersection with, of that with, with the carbon agenda, people are still a little bit confused about, but I think that people are coming on side. And in terms of what they should be doing, I think that this is where, again, I think the construction industry has such a wealth of potential because you can simply take one thing that you, you think you could, you could do something about, take composite materials or, or windows or, or maybe introducing uh, the idea of product as service on, on a, one of your projects and, and see where it goes. Because um, I think this is those, those days when, when innovation can come from all quarters you know, and, you know, a thousand flowers can bloom. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I'm a great believer that we have um, so many of the answers already. Um, you know, I'm working increasingly with a number of, number of um, innovative startups working across the climate and ecological crisis, and of course, circular economy is a big part of that. Um, I'm interested about how do we get those into the building uh, value chain? It's, a lot of the solutions are out there, but they're not being used. And if they are, it's a sort of one-off, it's a pilot. But we're not, well, I'm certainly not seeing this sort of mainstreaming. Yeah. So do you think it's yeah. a sort of, is it a policy requirement? Is it clients need to ask yeah. for it? Is it contractors? Is it architects? Do you need to be designing it in from the first yeah. place? Yeah. Well, you know, without question, if you look back on what has changed practice uh, in the construction industry towards better methods of doing things, um, very often it is uh, regulation and policy based when people realize that the consequences of not doing things a certain way. So the London plan, uh, and indeed London's not the only city, Amsterdam has circularity declaration, um, other places do as well. The whole of Wales actually has, has adopted circularity. The, the, uh, the, the Senate, uh, the Welsh assembly uh, has adopted a circularity position. But I think that, Unlike, say, carbon emissions, where you could set a metric and you can, that there are standard ways of measuring heat loss and so on. I think with circularity, we don't yet have that granular uh, you know, um, set of tools which will allow us to say, well, this much material use is right, or we should make this much recyclable and then incrementally set st tighter standards and move towards mm -hmm. it. I think we probably are not yet, we don't have the knowledge yet to be fully on that, but it's coming very quickly. I mean, remember that global uh, report on, on circularity is the first uh, systematic evaluation. That's only a couple of years ago. Um, and, you know, RAP has been uh, assessing only the waste stream, but that's only one aspect of circularity, the, 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 the circle economics report is a much more sophisticated one uh, which covers all all aspects so i think it's it's still relatively early days and you mentioned there the, the almost ease compared to circularity that climate change mitigation we can measure kilowatt hours and greenhouse gas emissions mm -hmm. from the operation of buildings there's a a growing conversation in the industry and action i'm glad to say on embodied carbon and of course there we can also start I get a nice, yes. pretty clean metric in terms of yes. uh, CO2. Um, so do you think that could actually, if we, if we align our circular economy conversations with that embodied carbon conversation, could that really be the push? I think there is, without question, a, a very, very interesting overlap there. Yeah. Uh, going back to steel for a moment, I, I, I doubt if everyone real, knows that steel making is, has about the highest amount of recycling of almost any product, um, possibly with the exception of aluminium. But steel that we use, I think it's something like 80% uh, 
of of scrap steel is recycled. So uh, it has very high recyclability, but it also that recycling has a huge carbon footprint. So recycling methods that are very carbon intensive are in some ways, you know, taking with one hand and, uh, you know, giving away with the other. But there is now a plant being trialed. I think it's in Sweden, the Hybrid plant, a steel plant, which is going to be run on electricity, first to create hydrogen and then to smelt the steel and achieve the blast uh, that you need for steel making. So there's a, um, you know, ex that is an extraordinary piece of work to build an electrically powered steel mm -hmm. plant. And that's kind of the perfect match of circularity, combining recyclability of steel with, with making that with electricity, which means that we can, you know, technologically find the solutions, the continuing use of fabulous materials like steel. Hmm. Plastics may be uh, another and, issue. Um, <laughs> yeah, which interestingly, you know, is the issue on sort of on the public's lips. And yeah. there's a lot of discussion there around, uh, you know, flights and food and fashion and consumables in terms of people's personal impact. But you know, if we look at if we look at the stat that you know, we often say 40% of UK GVC we use, but you know, you, you're saying actually it's 55%. Where you know. Well, we won't, we won't get into this as a question because we don't have time, but, you know, I'll just leave it for everyone to think about is where is the conversation in kind of mainstream media and, you know, down the pub, which um, admittedly it's my friendship group, but, uh, you know, is talking about impact in other ways, but it's actually the places we inhabit and we work in, um, which are the majority of it. So we sort of need to somehow get that mainstream and maybe there we'll get, we'll get the right questions asked of us as a profession. Um, I'm going to have to move us on now, but that, that was okay. excellent. Thank you so much, Sanand, uh, for your time. And hopefully everyone's inspired by that, that there's, yes, there's plenty to do, but there's plenty of people who have already gone quite far on that journey that we can learn from. As you say, looking towards some of those, often they do seem to be the, the Northern European com uh, countries who are further ahead of things like your symbiosis and in, and in terms of circularity in the built environment. So. It's great that this circuit project is teamed up, teamed up with the likes of um, Copenhagen and Hamburg and, and Helsinki, and actually we can get that learning um, across this. So thank you very much for your time today, and we'll have you involved in the project, I'm sure, later on. Thanks. Um, I'm, I'm going to hand us over now, um, before I close, just back to Andrea, who we saw this morning. Um, and she's gonna hi there andrea um you're going to give us a little bit more of an update on the ce london week what people can expect and still get involved yes uh, thank you alistair and i just wanted to say um thank you to you for hosting sanand for being our keynote speaker um and also just to everyone who's worked behind the scenes to make today um a success i feel like it's been a success and um, I hope everyone online has enjoyed it. Um, so today, um, as I hope many of you know, is uh, part of uh, CE Week, London CE Week 2020, um, hosted by Elwarb and Circular London. Um, so today uh, was uh, our circular construction um, theme this morning. Um, but there are many more um, events planned throughout the rest of the week. Um, this is kind of a brief overview of, of, you know, a snapshot of what is planned. Um, if anyone is interested, they should head over to the CE Week London website. You, once you register on there, you can um, see the whole schedule. You can uh, either see the live links for the various talks that are going ahead um, live on the platform, or you can get, um, register for separate webinars. Um, there really is something for everyone on there, um, from uh, nappies to behavior change. Um, and there's also, I'm really pleased to um, say, there's also quite a lot of other built environment specific events. Um, so there's just a um, snapshot of what's on there related to the built environment. Um, first of all, this afternoon, the ASBP are actually hosting um, a session looking at uh, circular economy, reuse and construction. Uh, there's two items tomorrow, one from NLA looking at smart cities and another one from Arup. Um, looking at materials and then on 
Friday, hang on, I've lost my days already, on the 4th of June, um, there's three built environment related sessions, uh, one from Globechain, uh, one from Useful Projects, um, and another one from Biome. Um, so yeah, if anyone wants to get involved in any of those events, they just need to head over to the ceweek.london website. Um, but apart from that, that's um, thanks again from me. Thank you, Andrea. Um, it's been a pleasure to host, so thanks for asking me. Um, and to everyone else, please do get involved in those upcoming events. With the weather as it is, I suggest that you all sit outside with your laptops listening in. That would be very nice. Um, but also do sign up to the project mailing list for Circuit. Uh, it will be posted, a link will be posted at the end of this session. And then just finally to say that uh, the Circuit crew will be back on Twitter live again at 4.30 today, where we will hear all the ideas, the pitches from the hackathon, which I'm certainly excited to see going back to that innovation. We need more ideas, more concepts, and hopefully we can get more solutions. So do tune back in for that. Um, that's the end of the morning here. Go and enjoy your lunch. Go and enjoy the sun. And goodbye from me. Thanks very much.